Thank you for downloading episode 45 of the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast. Before we begin, please take a moment to listen to this important message. Evening all. My name is Police Constable Arsenal Guinness of the Metropolitan Plod. On behalf of Her Majesty the Queen, God bless you mum, and her rather fit granddaughter-in-law, I am here to warn you about the counterfeit episodes of Murder Mile, what is knocking about. Proper episodes of the Murder Mile podcast can be easily spotted as they contain good editing, authentic sounds, solid research, Wikipedia, mature content, willies, and realistic accents, such as Scottish, Hokai the New, Welsh, there's lovely. And French. Oi, oi, oi. And according to the host, each episode is made with love. <gasps> no, not that sort. To ensure what you are listening to is legit and not bogus or duff, having been smuggled into Dover by being shoved up a Mexican's poo pipe, subscribe to Patreon today and get your proper episode of Murder Mile a full three days early. Unless he forgets. Ah, shit. Which he does. This message is not endorsed by the Metropolitan Police or any member of the Rosers. The character with a shitty accent is entirely fictional and bears absolutely no relation to any person I have ever met, and any similarity to any Guinness-drinking Arsenal-loving copper with a Kate or Pippa Middleton fixation is purely coincidental. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the episode. Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved and long forgotten murders, all set within London's West End. Today's episode is about Camille Gordon, a bubbly student with a beaming smile, a big heart and a bright future, who had no enemies only friends. And yet someone wanted her dead. But why? Murder Mile is researched using authentic sources. It contains moments of satire, shock and grisly details. And as a dramatisation of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds. So that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 45, Who Killed Camille Gordon? Today, I'm standing on Archer Street in Soho W1, one road south of Brewer Street where George Pickering stabbed Rosa O'Neill to death. Five doors down from the White Horse public house, where Larry Winters shot Paddy O'Keefe. And I'm right next door to the top floor flat, where Soho's most infamous pimp strangled his most valuable sex worker to death with her own stockings. Only available on a murder mile walk. Bookended by the bland back end of Shaspi Avenue's Apollo Theatre to the left and the infamous Windmill Theatre to the right, Archer Street is a former Victorian slum. And being a thin one-way street, barely 200 feet long, with strangely vague and oddly anonymous four and five storey buildings on either side, even on the brightest of days, Archer Street is cast in shadow. Although Archer Street is situated smack bang in the middle of Soho's red light district, in stark contrast, it's drab, dark and deathly silent. Looking as it does, like the kind of dirty hovel where trucks unload, waiters smoke, drunks whittle, crack addicts puke, and a certain bald tour guide points to scenes of grisly death. All of which happens 
within a few feet of a primary school. Nice. Today, gasp, shock. Archer Street is being gentrified. And as much as I may lambast those hairy-faced hipsters who dress like a yeti, moonlighting as an Elizabethan chimney sweep, who talk like Danny Dyer, quoting Proust whilst dying of the plague, who've uploaded every single second of their miserable little life, even though they have the personality of an anus, and who've overcomplicated a simple beverage to such an extent, it makes you want to scream, I just want a f***ing coffee! There is one bright spot on the whole street, and that is Galupo at number 7 Archer Street. A joyous and brightly coloured blue and white tiled Italian ice cream shop, full of rich, soft, sumptuous scoops of mouth-wateringly inventive flavours, such as tropical eaten mess, blueberry cheesecake, chocolate Earl Grey, and pims and lemonade. Mmm. And yet, beyond the sweet smell of icy treats, Number 7 Archer Street hides a deadly secret. As it was here, on Monday the 1st of March 2004, outside of an infamous Soho clip joint called the Blue Bunny Club, that an innocent woman called Camille Gordon was stabbed to death. Why anyone would hate Camille Gordon is a mystery. Camille loved kids. She adored them. And with her lifelong dream to become a nursery school teacher, it was obvious to anyone who had met her that it was a job she was perfect for. And being described by those who knew her as beautiful inside and out, Camille was warm, caring and loving. A vivacious girl who was instantly likeable, easily approachable and effortlessly patient, who could illuminate a room with a smile and could make any stranger feel welcome. And with silky smooth skin, soft gentle features, warm chestnut eyes and brown shoulder length hair, as a pretty girl with a heart of gold, Camille was the kind of person you couldn't help but gravitate towards. So given her sweet, warm and generous nature, as a nursery school teacher, Camille would have been absolutely perfect. And yet, she ended up dead in the heart of Soho's red light district. Born on the Caribbean island of Jamaica in 1981 and raised in a strong, loving and supportive family, although they struggled financially, Camille had a very normal upbringing. And even though her grades were good, feeling that her homeland lacked the opportunities she needed to truly fulfil her dream, with her mother's blessing, 21-year-old Camille waved farewell to the sun-kissed tropics and headed to the bright prospects but miserable drizzle of England. Described by a close friend as a little bit naive, being a young girl in a strange land, although England was an exciting place, Camille was street smart and she was not about to take any risks. Staying with relatives, Camille lived for two years in the industrial city of Birmingham in the West Midlands, studying at Handsworth College by day and working as a waitress by night, with additional hours as a nursery assistant at weekends. And although she was stuck in the classic student dilemma of either being too poor to eat, too busy to earn or too tired to learn, she remained totally focused on her goal. 
And so, by the summer of 2003, Camille graduated with a teaching certificate. With her dream coming true, being eager to start her career, to pay off her student loan, and to earn a modest wage, some of which she would send home to support her mother, Camille moved to the bustling city of London. But times were hard, money was tight, and with nursery placements being few and far between, temp work being badly paid, and waitressing only available at unsociable hours. Seeking to supplement her meagre income with a well-paying part-time job, whilst she enrolled in further education, Camille struggled to make ends meet. So one night, in the bleak winter of 2003, being a pretty girl with a slim figure, a soft voice and a sweet face, dressed in six-inch heels, black stockings and a tight-fitting dress, Camille sashayed up Rupert Street into the dark heart of Soho's red light district. Surrounded by a sea of seedy sex dens, which bathed her silky skin in a gaudy neon haze. As Camille tottered along the puke-lined, urine-soaked street, dodging drunks and leering louts, she was enveloped by the pitch-black gloom of Archer Street. As against the sinister facade of Number 7, in a doorway draped in a purple velvet curtain and under a flashing neon sign, which simply read, Girls. Camille stood, as the hostess of the Blue Bunny Club, luring young men near, with a wink, a smile, and a come-hither finger. As for just a fiver, she promised them a good time, with a pretty lady. But this is not what you think. This is not a story about a vulnerable young girl who being broke, hungry and hard up, sinks into drink, falls into drugs, is sold by a gang into the Soho sex trade and in a vicious circle of abuse is murdered simply for disobeying her pimp. Far from it. This is a story about a bright girl with a big heart a warm smile and a blossoming dream of becoming a nursery school teacher. And it still is. That was her goal, and she was going for it. But she didn't have a dark side, she wasn't leading a double life, and she wasn't starving, desperate or forced. And although being a hostess in a notorious Soho clip joint was outside of her comfort zone, as a part-time job, the hours were short, the pay was good, and with her role requiring no nudity or sex acts of any kind, by strict orders of the management, all she had to do was talk and smile. So as a smart, strong and ambitious young woman, the decision to become a hostess at the Blue Bunny Club was one she had made independently. And yet, a few months later, someone would want her dead. But Camille wasn't unique. With clip joints and lap dancing clubs being on the fringes of the sex trade, both of which are licensed by local councils, with London being the most expensive city in Europe, given a choice between waitressing for minimum wage, stacking shelves at night, or bar work whilst being accosted by drunken louts. Many hostesses and lap dancers aren't trafficked women, but are actually students, nurses and young mums. All busy girls with big dreams, looking for quick and entirely legal cash. Whilst being protected by strict laws 
CCTV and a barrage of burly bouncers. And in the same way that outside of almost every club, bar and restaurant, in almost every city, the first person you'll see is a hostess. A beautiful young woman who is instantly likeable, easily approachable and effortlessly patient. Who can make any stranger feel welcome. So being a hostess at the Blue Bunny Club was merely a well-paying part-time job in a role that Camille was perfect for. By Monday the 1st of March 2004, Camille had enrolled in further education. Her rent was paid, her life was good, she was happy, well and thriving. But that night, a total stranger would be fueled by so much hatred for Camille that he would end her life forever. And yet, they'd only just met. But why? To understand the murder, you have to understand how clip joints like the Blue Bunny Club operate. And to do that, you'll need to come with me on a little walk into Soho. Don't worry, it'll be okay. The date is Monday the 1st of March 2004. It's 5 p.m. As you slip out of the rush hour bustle of Shaftesbury Avenue, you slink onto Rupert Street, a short cobblestoned road strewn with swirling litter. Its slight incline stretching up past a dither of daytime drinkers a huddle of homeless beggars and a prong of porn-perusing perverts clutching bafflingly indiscreet brown paper bags. But what draws your eye is that in almost every doorway, on both sides of the street, stand long lines of very pretty girls, all slim, semi-clad and smouldering. Being young, inexperienced and desperate, a smorgasbord of lovely ladies, who would usually look right through you, beckon you nearer with sultry smiles and come-to-bed eyes. And with every bookshop, brothel, strip club, S&M store and porn theatre screaming the word SEX, as gaudy neon signs flash with unsubtle subliminal messages like girls, nude and triple X. Sex is why you are here. But as any farmer will tell you, just because you're in a field of cows, it doesn't mean you can buy a steak. And as a nervous young lad, too shy to watch strippers, too timid to be lap danced and too terrified to bust your cherry in a brothel. With your heart racing and walking awkwardly as you struggle to stifle a burgeoning boner, not wanting to be noticed, you're lured into the shadowy gloom of Archer Street and the dark facade of the Blue Bunny Club. But there's no need to be scared. It's not menacing, it's reassuring. As from the brightly lit doorway, bathed in a pink neon haze that hints at hidden flesh, and amidst the heart-quickening pulse of disco, a stunning young lady with silky smooth skin, soft gentle features, and warm chestnut eyes, lures you near with a wink, a smile, and a come-hither finger. And being the type of girl who can make any stranger feel welcome, everything she says in her soft Jamaican lilt is just what you want to hear. As in a swirl of words like girls, drinks and erotic show, being stood next to a large sign which reads £5 entrance fee, with security cameras on the ceiling, bouncers on the door 
and the club's terms and conditions fixed to the wall. Thinking, wow, if she's the lady they put on reception, imagine the bevy of beauties that await me inside. You hand her your crinkled fiver, and as she slides back the purple velvet curtain, leading down into the excitement of the basement, in a voice as warm and reassuring as a nursery school teacher, she says, Have fun! as you descend into the Blue Bunny Club. With each step, your mind imagines the world within, a paradise for your swollen penis, and a nirvana for your aching nads. As amidst a cavernous expanse of naked flesh, stunners sway on swings, pretty ladies slide on phallic poles, and bosomy babes frolic together in a champagne fountain. As a sweaty heaving mass of young men, swarmed in a sea of jiggling boobs and butts, lie exhausted like dribbling wrecks, their bodies trashed by a life-changing orgy of carnality and debauchery. And as you reach the bottom step, your heart racing, your mouth dry, and your loins engorged. As you excitedly pull back the plush red curtain of your sexual utopia, the first thing that greets you is... Disinfectant. The oddly unerotic whiff of antibacterial floor cleaner, which stings your nostrils. For a few seconds, as your eyes acclimatise to the dark, you wonder if you've stumbled into the broom cupboard. But slowly, across the small gloomy room, you see a tiny wooden bar, an empty stage, and several stained sofas, on which sit a handful of single and rather awkward looking men. Realising your mistake, as your Adam's apple bobs and your sphincter tightens, you quickly turn to leave. But behind you, a beefcake bouncer blocks your only exit. And as you nervously utter, uh, it's a bit quiet. With an emotionless yet menacing look, the looming lump growls, it's still early. Which, no matter what the hour, it always is as the barrel-chested brute ushers you towards the bar. Needing a stiff drink to steady your nerves, as you sidle up, your shoes struggling to rip free from the unarousing grip of the sticky lino, you scan the poorly lit wooden alcove for any tipple which takes your fancy. But with no draft taps, no spirit optics, and no branded bottles, you quiz the rather bland-looking barmaid. Do you have any beers? Audibly huffing, like she's unsure how to inflate a balloon. As for the fiftieth time that hour, her razor-sharp talons point to the drinks menu, which has just three options. Soft drinks, low beer, and virgin cocktails. As she barks, we don't serve alcohol. And it's true, they don't. Clip joints don't have liquor licenses, so legally they can't sell booze. If they did, they'd be breaking the law. This was scrawled on the club's terms and conditions, by the door. But as your swollen love trumpet was too busy leading you downstairs, you didn't bother to read it. So as you slump onto the tacky red sofa, mottled with a mishmash of dubious stains, which you deduce are most likely to be Vimto, Blackcurrant Cordial, or Roller Cola, you daintily sup this egg cup's worth of watered down fruit juice, a steal at just 20 pounds. And as the several scared men 
stare expectantly at the empty stage. As the unused pole gleams brightly, you think, maybe I just missed a show. Or perhaps, it's, it's still early. Which no matter what the hour, it always is. But the truth is, clip joints don't have an entertainment license. So legally, they can't put on a show. If they did, they'd be breaking the law. And as a mildly attractive, yet blatantly disinterested lady sits beside you, her face caked in half an inch of makeup to mask her look of disdain, being semi-sexually dressed in black, like she's keen to cop off with a funeral corpse, and being draped in a feather boa, as nothing says sexy like an itchy scarf made of a dead bird's plumage. As her vague pleasantries clumsily segue into you buying her a drink, which as an employee, surely she gets for free. Suddenly you realize it's a con. Nothing is gonna happen between you and this lady, nothing. Not a kiss, not a hug, not a how do you do. This is a clip joint. They don't have a sex establishment license. So even a legally acceptable sex act, like a strip tease or a lap dance, cannot take place. If it did, they'd be breaking the law. Furious that you've been duped into blowing 25 pounds to sit alone for several minutes, in an empty club, swigging fruit cordial, you get up to leave. But beyond the suspiciously mottled red velvet curtain, should be a set of dark lit steps, ascending to the club's only exit. Except it's blocked by two tree trunk sized apes in tuxedos, one of whom hands you a bill in his gigantic hairy fist. What? I, I already paid, you mutter. A fiver on the door and 20 quid for the drink. And as your brain scrambles to fathom how you could possibly have accrued such an extortionate bill in such a short period of time, thinking this could be a prank, their unflinching faces say otherwise. As here, everything costs. From the privilege of talking to the hostess and the honor of buying her a drink to the pleasure of missing a show. And with the bar, having a two drink minimum spend and a 300 pound service charge on top, all of which was clearly written in their terms and conditions and none of which you bothered to read. So for now, you're going nowhere until they get their money. And as two oversized brutes loom over you, their colossal calloused hands perched on your trembling shoulders as their hot breath snorts down your perspiring neck, as you fumble for your wallet, you consider calling the police. But on what charge? They haven't broken the law. And besides, it's not like you've been mugged. Face it, you are the mug. Many men feel so ashamed that they pay in full. Some are so terrified that they hand over their wallets. Some plead poverty only to be frog marched to the nearest cash machine. And yet some men becomes so enraged that by lashing out, this allows the bouncers to use physical force. And feeling humiliated, cheated and robbed, most men chalk this up as a lesson learned and make the wise decision never to go back. But one man, he wanted revenge. On Monday the 1st of March 2004, at 6.20pm, 
a customer approached. He was mid-twenties, five foot eight inches tall and dark-skinned. Wearing blue jeans, white trainers, a black hat with a white stripe, and a dark hooded jacket emblazoned with the motif of the Cleveland Indians Major Baseball League. Greeted by Camille, and having paid his fiver, he was led downstairs into the Blue Bunny Club. Ten minutes later, being handed a bill for £370, a heated argument ensued. And having been fleeced to the tune of £90, the man was forcibly ejected by the bouncers, spewing curses as he stormed off down Archer Street. For those at the Blue Bunny Club, this was just an ordinary day. But having been made to feel stupid, 40 minutes later, the furious man returned. Camille was standing in the doorway, smiling, chatting, and earning a few more pounds to fund her dream of becoming a nursery school teacher, a job she would have been perfect for. As being a vivacious girl who was instantly likeable, easily approachable, and effortlessly patient, she could make any stranger feel welcome. Except this stranger didn't feel welcome. He felt angry and humiliated. With the club's owners elsewhere and the bouncers otherwise engaged, even though Camille was only a part-time hostess, who he had briefly met barely moments before, Seething with rage and being furious, not at her, but what she represented. He stabbed her once in the heart. And after a long struggle, as she fought to stay alive, at 8.25pm, 23-year-old Camille Gordon was pronounced dead. And even though the police have his DNA, his fingerprints his description and clear CCTV footage of the attack and his escape as he fled into Piccadilly Circus tube station, her murderer remains at large. Camille Gordon was a beautiful young girl with a sweet smile, a kind heart and big dreams, who had no enemies, only friends, who wasn't hated, only loved. And yet, owing to a legal loophole on the fringes of Soho's sex trade, to which, for many decades, the council had turned a blind eye, an innocent young woman was brutally stabbed to death by an angry man, simply because he didn't bother to read the small print. So who killed Camille Gordon? That we may never know. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Don't forget, if you are a murky miler, to stay tuned for extra goodies after the break. But before that, here are my recommended podcasts of the week, which are Already Gone and Going Postal. I'm Nina Instad, host of Already Gone, a true crime podcast focused on Detroit, Michigan, and the Great Lakes region. We look at older or lesser-known cases, stories that you won't hear anywhere else. In the weeks ahead, we're covering unsolved murders, missing persons cases, and looking back at a few resolved cases that made the headlines. Listen to Already Gone on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcatcher. Hi, I'm Carla. And I'm Michael. And we're Go Postal Podcast. We're the podcast that tells you stories about what people have done while drunk, while also giving you some facts about boobs, booze, and the bazaar in the places where these stories take place. We also have a weekly contest where you tell us where the F I am. So join us for some drinking, learning, and laughing. 
You can listen on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Find us online at Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Go Postal Podcast, and send us your drunk ramblings and anecdotes. You can also email your stories to GoPostalPodcast at gmail.com. Auf Wiedersehen. Ciao. As always, a big thank you goes out this week to my new Patreon supporters who are so desperate to see extra videos of my big fat head that they've signed up for more. So either they use it to frighten their kids, to measure melons, or they're werewolves and my balloon-shaped bonce reminds them of the moon. Either way, this week's weirdos are Sissy Scoveback, Lisa Lebo, Vicky Joseph, Anne Stangroom, Darren James, Katrina Van Der Vliet, and Jennifer Yee. God, I hope I've pronounced those correctly. I probably haven't. I apologise. Uh, thank you, guys. There are some lovely moon-faced videos coming your way very soon. And also a big thank you to Marie, Tracy, Sean, Lorna and Cheryl, who booked onto my Murder Mile walk recently. Uh, we had a fabulous time. Thank you so much. It was lovely to meet you guys. And also thank you to Marie for those lovely Bakewell tarts, which mysteriously vanished. Mmm hence my big fat head but of course the biggest thank you of the week goes out to everyone who listens to Murder Mile thank you to everyone I really do appreciate it Murder Mile is researched written and performed by myself with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with No Name thank you for listening and sleep well This week's cake of choice, whilst <laughs> whilst doing extra mile, is oh. See, I, I worked up my way through all those uh, bakewell tarts. They were delicious. Thank you, Marie. I worked my way, way through all those fondant fancies from last week. There was actually two boxes of eight. I demolished those. Um, this week's cake of choice is it's from Lidl. Uh, it's a chocolate and hazelnut croissant. Oh, I've already had one already. In fact, I had two yesterday, and I've had to save this one for the morning. Uh, hey guys, welcome to Extra Mile. Uh, if you're new to uh, Extra Mile, this is the part of the show where we talk about the extra stuff that you I didn't put into the episode that you can learn a bit more. It's also a bit of fun as well. It's a bit, it's more lightweight than kind of a regular episode. You know, you wouldn't have me fiddling with a bag. You wouldn't have me um, with a my kettle on in the background i'm making a cup of tea so i can enjoy this episode uh you wouldn't have me reaching over to look at my watch to work out what the time is okay that's fine um so this is the part of the show where we just have a bit of fun and there's no editing in it and uh stuff like that and uh, also i wouldn't be looking around and realizing i've got a big hole in my pajamas that's not good is it <laughs> oh god i'm so poor so uh while we're waiting for the kettle to boil i just want to say welcome to everyone uh welcome to all new listeners if you're new to uh, murder mile thank you so much for tuning in um uh thank you to regular listeners people who've been there through the start or just finding it now or binging it uh so welcome a big thank you to everyone recently i've had a lot of really lovely messages from people which has been fantastic um you know people just just sending me whether whether tweets or or do you know I get emails and it do you know it really it's really nice it's really uplifting uh, especially it's it's been a struggle to write some of these episodes not because they're particularly harrowing it's just I think I've burnt myself out a bit so I'm a bit exhausted so getting up is a bit of a, a mission at the moment uh, but waking up in the morning rolling over and thinking oh god I've got to write some more and then looking at my phone and seeing all these lovely messages coming in is just fantastic so uh thank you to everyone for that I really really is very much appreciated uh looking around waiting for my coffee my tea it's still bubbling away so um I've done that bit I'm looking at my notes I know uh right okay um now 
Murder Mile. I think I said last week that what I was going to do was do... That kettle's going to boil any second. Come on, kettle. Come on, kettle. Come on, let's... Let, I tell you what, let me sort out my cup of tea and then we're done. And then we can dive into Murder Mile. Uh, nice cup of tea, yes. Powdered milk, as always. It's because it's not winter yet, because I don't have a fridge, and because it's not winter yet, I haven't got any proper milk because it goes off too quick. But in winter, I'll mention this later on, but in winter, the great thing on the boat is you don't need a fridge. You just put the milk down on the floor or in the lowest part of a cupboard, and because it's underwater, technically, there you go, tea's done, um, uh, it actually keeps milk really cold. So winter, it's really good. I can actually have cheeses and butter and... Uh, milk and things like that so that's really good so there we go just making my tea nice cup of tea this will be this is the first of pro oh shit this will be the first of probably five today can't can't not have tea but right, there we go cupboard closed right coming back coming back Oh, that cake staring at me. Look at it, it's staring at me like a little evil little thing. It's saying, eat me. I think I will. So, um, I think last week I was saying that what I was going to do with this this uh, season of Murder Mile was do two more. I was going to do the Freddie Mills episode. Then take a bit of a break, do some extra miles, take a week off, and then come back with the multi-parter. Um, but what I've realised is is I've worked out something that I should have done right at the start. Because I started with season one and I literally did I did 32 episodes back to back with two extra miles in the centre and I didn't take a break. And it it was pretty knackering and I should have taken a break between season two season one and two, but I didn't because I, I was like, oh I was too excited to write some more episodes, so I didn't take a break. I took like ten minutes and I think I've burnt myself out. So, because I'm, I really want to get the Freddie Mills episode absolutely nailed and get it really right. What I'm going to do is this. So, oh, I got burpees. Sorry, this is getting bad, isn't it? Every time I I record, I get burpees. And as you noticed last week, little trumps as well. Not trumps in Eric and the other seed of Satan. Uh, I mean, bottom trumps. It's the same thing, really, isn't it? Um, so. <laughs> God, there's, uh, there's going to be some people in America who hated that. Well, you know, we all have po we all have our own politics, don't we? So, uh, what I decide to do with this episode? So, this will be this is episode forty five. This will be the last uh, episode in this section of season two. So, what I'm going to do? I'm going to make this a rule from in the new season. So, um, in the new season, season three, I'll do ten episodes. I will put in two extra mile episodes so that gives me a chance to kind of break rest a bit uh, and do some research and then I'll come back with a multi-parter and then I will take time off after that I'll make sure I put in some time to to relax but with this season what I'll do this will be the last episode in the section I'm going to put in three extra mile episodes I've already planned them I've been planning them for ages so they're all ready to go and they're easy for me to do and uh, you know it, it takes me a couple of hours it's piece of piece of pp and I'm looking forward to them, actually, because I think they'll be good fun and quite interesting. So we'll do that. And then I'll take a week off. Uh, and then I'll, we'll come back. So that will be the start of November. So you'll 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 only miss me for one week. You'll have I'll be loads of stuff going out in October. Um, and then November, we'll come back. We'll do the Freddie Mills two-parter, which I'm really excited to do. I'm looking forward to that one. And then we'll come back with a, we'll come back with the big multi-parter. Uh, I think I said before that it was going to be Dennis Nielsen. I'm not going to do Dennis. Uh, I've decided I've already covered enough interesting territory with Dennis. I might do some some mini episodes on Dennis. But um, there's another case that I've been desperate to cover for a while. I've got some new files from the archive, some different angles that I can take on this. So even though it's a case that you may have heard about, I'm not going to say what it is yet... Um, It'll, it'll be a really interesting case, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to really diving into doing it the same the same way that I did with the Blackout Ripper, of not just focusing on the same old crap that everyone else does, which is <laughs> murderer kills people. It's like it's victim centric. It's like where are they from? What are they about? And trying to understand everyone as a murderer, everyone as a kind of victim, really, because murderers, you know, where do they come from? Why 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 do they why do they they end up that way? 
you know, you don't wake up and decide to become a murderer. Something has to happen in your life. I'm also going to look into the, this um, this serial killer's kind of his family as well, those around him, the the, the history of his life, the, the circumstances around where he was living. So that's going to be really exciting. So uh, three extra miles, break. Then we'll do a 10-parter. That'll lead us into Christmas and New Year. Um, probably two weeks, yeah, probably mid-January. Uh, and then I have to take time off anyway. Which is good because I'm getting the boat the boat serviced and I've got repairs to do. So this won't be a multi-parter where I go, ooh, another week. This will literally be, if this is not, if I've not finished this by end of January, I'm screwed. Because I'm, the boat's coming out of the water and I've got repairs to do. So And, that, and that'll be me off social media and emails and everything for like uh, eight days easily eight days so uh yeah i need to be ready for that so whew, that was a lot of talking wasn't it Whew. so um hope you enjoyed that episode what i'm constantly trying to do with this is is to uh make sure that each week that you have a very different episode uh even though there's a formula to how i write them what i'm trying to do is is make sure that they're different stories that they're uh about different types of people that they're in different periods of time even though it could be the same areas sometimes i do move it around as well but also i try and mix the style of the story of how i tell it as well so uh so say like last week's episode was very kind of it was the last three days of uh susan moyer quite a heart-renting story but very detailed into her, her last few days of of being uh beaten to death this story uh, Camille Gordon was very different. I kind of came across this a little while ago. It's it's a, a location that's on one of my walks. It's actually right next door to one of the murder locations that I look at, and it's next door to the the Larry Winters pub, uh, the White Horse. So, uh, um, so it's yeah, it's an interesting case, and I felt it needed to be covered. There wasn't really a lot of information out there, which was a, a, a real uh, bit of a pig. Um, so what I had to do was really dive down into into all the different sources that I could find. There was a lot of police statements out there because obviously they're still trying to find out who the murderer was. Uh, and then I just had to piece it together. But that wasn't enough for an episode. So what I decided to do was tell it the way that I told it there, which was explaining about the world and taking you into that world so you understand the world before you see the murderer before you see the murder itself so uh, so by the end literally i don't have to tell you anything literally as soon as i've explained the world you're kind of like oh okay i understand what's going on so literally we didn't need to go into the the details at the end uh which i think make, makes for a, a more interesting episode same as with the the glindor michael I, I i think that was a good episode because it was i like to t throw you off every so often so you don't think you know what you're going to get i think that keeps me very entertained with glindor michael there's no murder in that at all it's a murder mile episode and yet there's no murder and yet i would say it's one of i think people seem to agree it's one of the one of the one of the better episodes because it's really about heart it's really about people i just had a nice email this morning from uh uh it was a lovely it's all initials but very very nice someone just sent me a very nice uh ah oh, someone's just cancelled for this weekend that's annoying uh jen in seattle just literally got your message this morning as i woke up so thanks jen about operation mincemeat i entirely agree it's kind of like we all know about operation mincemeat but we don't know anything about glindor michael which is why i decided to do the glindor michael episode and just focus on his life on who he was as a man and that uh that's what i tried to do with these episodes and that's what i tried to do with um this episode camille gordon very little is known about her the police haven't w w quite rightly haven't released a lot of information about about her about her life about this murderer we we still know very little because obviously they don't want to give too much away because they want if the footage that they have which they obviously they know it is, is of the man who murdered her, because obviously there was cameras inside the building, uh, and he was witnessed stabbing her. Obviously they want him to trip up when they uh, when they interview him. They want him to be able to say things that they've never released. So, uh, so uh, okay. Um, where am I? Okay. Uh, oh, okay. I thought I'd throw this in. So, um, oh, so um, I mentioned in there, I might... I. Obviously, I record this extra mile after I've recorded the 
audio for Murder Mile, but then I edit. So sometimes I may say in Extra Mile things that don't exist in the episode. And that's because I've taken them out. But obviously I don't edit Extra Mile. So I may say things that I've accidentally deleted. So in this Extra Mile episode, I mentioned that a lap dancer had mentioned to me about why she does the job that she does. I'll mention about that. It was it was a few years ago. I was invited onto a stag do. Uh, slightly sad. It was kind of like we were in a lap dancing club at four o'clock in the afternoon. Four in the afternoon. It was empty. It was dead. Um, it's not really my thing. Uh, although I, do, I, I like looking at pretty ladies. Don't get me wrong. But it's just not my thing really. Uh, <laughs> embarrassingly, I get a bit dizzy. I get a bit dizzy if anyone gets too close to me. So I, I tend to stand a bit back. So lap dancing is not for me anyway i started talking to this really lovely uh, uh lady she was a lap dancer she really liked the shirt i was wearing because it was kind of a ben sherman shirt but it had uh it had uh, balinese dancers on it and it was a really really beautiful shirt she was like oh my god i, I love that shirt can i have it and we, we got talking anyway i was asking her why she was a lap dancer and she was like uh i'm a student nurse and this this was in birmingham uh she was like i'm a student nurse um Obviously, it costs a lot of money to become a nurse. I need to study all the time. Uh, but I also need to be able to afford to live in the city as well. I need to be local so for my studies. Um, and she said, look, what I can do is either I can get a job as a bar woman. Uh, and that means I'm probably going to have to work at least half of my week. I'm going to have to work late nights, which means I'll be tired when I come in for studies in the morning. I'm going to get paid minimum wage. I'm going to be surrounded by drunks who are basically leering at me and all over me in gropey hands. And she says, and the, there's no one on the door and there's no protection at all. And she says, I'll earn very little money. Whereas she said, I come in here, I only have to work one night, one night a month. And she says, the CCTV everywhere, there's bouncers everywhere. You can't get away with anything. I'm in total control. Uh, you can't touch me if you touch me even like put your hand on me the bouncers will come over and li literally will escort you out it's like they're all over it and she said you know uh, i have to do one night a month and, I, and she makes good money off that she she makes enough money to cover her for the whole month on one night and she says all she has to do is basically do what she would do at hot yoga every week anyway she says it's the same as doing yoga except i'm just wearing a, a little bit less less clothes and do you know what She's a very attractive lady, she's confident with her body. What's the problem with that? You know? So, so I, you know, it was an eye opener for me. It kind of really made me realize, oh, actually, this is, you know, I always thought it was kind of ladies who extorted in there. But I mean, she broke it down to me. She said she was pointing out all the other ladies there, what they do as jobs. There were mums there and there were teachers and. You know, people trying to make their dreams come true, and uh, instead of working nights, uh, doing night shifts, and knackering themselves out, they're like, Do you know what? I'm an attractive girl, I've got a good body on me, use it while I've still got it. So uh, I thought that was really interesting. Um, some things I didn't put into the episode, which I, because obviously sometimes there's not enough time to uh, put everything in. Oh, cup of tea. Oh, I should have put more sugar in that. Damn it. Um, <laughs> so um, there was a, a, a section in here that I put about the residents of Archer Street. Because obviously, if you live on Archer Street, you pretty much live cheek to jowl with the sex trade all the time. Because Archer Street is right in the middle of Great Windmill Street and Rupert Street. Uh, and it's between Brewer Street and Shaftesbury Avenue. So basically you are surrounded on all sides by sex. Basically sex clubs and porn theatres and sex shops and brothels and everything. Um, and you would think that there would be a bit of a kind of a contretemps between kind of the residents and the kind of the sex trade. But it's been going on for so long. Like we're not just talking years. We're talking or oh, decades. We're talking centuries. So has been an area of sex for literally centuries. It's always been there. Um, but there, from what there seems to be, there doesn't seem to be any hatred or animosity between either groups, between the residents and the, the sex trade there. there. There is kind of... It's a mixture of indifference and mutual respect. So, um, and I think this is a good example of it. So because on the corner, on... Archer Street and Great Portland, Great Portland Street, Great Windmill Street, uh, there is Soho Parish Primary School. It's a fascinating street. When you walk down Great Windmill Street, in the, 
about 10 years ago. It's gentrified now. But it used to be lap dancing club, brothel, porn theatre, brothel, lap dancing club, brothel, 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 primary school, brothel, brothel, brothel. And it, But what they used to do, um, because many of the ladies who obviously work at the brothels are also mums themselves, what they would do at three o'clock every day, they would pull down all the curtains and the shutters and the blinds on all of the sex establishments so when all the kids come out of school, they don't see any of that. They don't see ladies standing in the doorway. They don't see signs saying sex, sex, sex. Do you know, it's just a regular street. And then at four o'clock, when all the kids have gone, the shutters go back up again, which I thought was a nice thing. There's a nice kind of balance between the people that live there and the sex trade. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, I deliberately didn't put into the story uh, the, what... Do you know, like, with each episode, what I normally do is put in details of what the person did that morning or the night before and what led up to that moment... Now, the problem is we don't know a hell of a lot about what Camille Gordon was doing the night before or the morning of. And although we have a couple of details, I deliberately took it out. So uh, what we do know. So uh, Detective Inspector Andy Mortimer, who's uh, who's in charge of the case. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So on the morning, um, this they, they say the morning. It's actually the night before. It's early in the morning. So the night before, so on the Sunday night, uh, Camille Gordon was at a club called Castaways on Peckham High Road, where she met a man who she knew from Birmingham, who then drove her home. Um, obviously, the police are still waiting to speak to that man um, uh, to see whether he's in connection with that. I took that out because obviously we don't know who he is or what it's about. Uh, and there was another man who came forward and gave uh, a witness statement to the police. Oh, he gave a statement to the police, but he never came back. So the police are still ch chasing off who he is. But there's no details about this man at all. Um, now, there's a real gentrification of Soho going on at the moment. It's been going on for the last 10 years. Obviously, Soho has been uh, an area of prostitution and sex trade and things like that for many 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 years but at the moment it's all being heavily gentrified and basically a lot of the sex trade is basically being pushed out or annihilated uh and that's and this actually uh was part of it so uh this actually helped the council uh as well as uh madam jojo's club around the corner literally being shut down there was um they were waiting it's it's been a great club for years. It used to be a, a kind of a striptease club, a kind of a burlesque club. It's been trading hands for ages. There was a, a bit of a fight between some bouncers and some um, some unruly men a couple of, couple of years ago. Not too long ago, actually. I think one of the bouncers had a baseball bat, attacked him. The guy didn't die, but he was injured. And the council said, no, that's it. Your club is shut forever. Basically, Westminster Council have been waiting for an excuse to shut a lot of these places down. And the murder of Camille Gordon was uh, a prime example. So immediately after the murder of Camille Gordon, this club was shut down. Blue, uh, I've got a photo that I'll show online. Unfortunately, it was taken the year afterwards. Uh, so it doesn't show what the Blue Bunny Club was exactly like. But immediately after that, it was shut down. And a lot of these lap dancing clubs were shut down immediately after that as well. Um but it did take them, um, the council and the police, a long time to shut clip joints down. Because the problem is, uh, in order to shut it down, you have to find the owner. And because it's it's an illegal trade, technically an illegal trade, although there's a loophole, um, you've got to build a case against the owner first. But then you have to try and track down who the owner is. So... Um, what they would do is they would lease the premises in, in false names and they would pay cash in rent. Uh, they'd, they'd have cars, but the cars are registered to different addresses. So it's hard to really get a police warrant to know where these people live, to really work out what it was. And then uh, the council would get a case against who they think the owner is. And then the owner would hand them in paperwork saying, oh, I don't own it anymore. It's It's gone to someone else. And it would just keep going back, back and forth, back and forth. So it was a nightmare for the council to really shut them down. Um, but 
the council have been keen to do this for ages to really gentrify the area. It's looking nice, but it's kind of, you know, the heart of what people are complaining about is even though the sex trade is being driven out, which means crime is hopefully going to go down in Soho because there are area pockets that are really big on crime. The problem is you're losing a lot of the original culture and that's what goes at the same time. The second you start getting gentrified places in, you start getting all these hipster tea shops and things like that. When you take away the sex clubs and things like that, you take away the little coffee shops that go with it you take away the little betting shops that go with it you take away you know the little corner stores you know all of these little different little pockets get driven out because gentrification brings up the prices of the rent and no one can afford to live there except posh people so that's really it's it's kind of a, a balance at the moment of what they're saying is we don't mind that the streets are being improved and it's looking better but you're lo you you're taking away the culture you're taking away what soho is really about um so uh so here's me looking at my notes my notes are all over the place at the moment why 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 so um going back to camille gordon uh hang on let me oh yeah so this is important this is important uh so after the murder of camille gordon um now what i said in there uh was that, that it was all about a legal loophole this was what was going on is that is that clip joints um we've we've heard about clip joints clip points clip joints in episode two before a second episode uh the bust up club the murder of tony meller that was a clip joint and I, I think i explained it in there that because they don't have an alcohol license they deliberately don't have an alcohol license therefore they can't be you know if they sell alcohol they can't be arrested for it so they don't they don't have an entertainment license and they don't have a sex establishment license which is what all um the local authority has uh, insists that all lap dancing clubs and striptease clubs have so you can go to the council and say i'm going to set up a lap dancing club and they go okay brilliant you need an alcohol license you need an entertainment license you need a sex establishment license i didn't know that there was such a thing but there is right um but clip joints deliberately don't have any of those therefore they don't need any of these licenses but they put it into their terms and conditions, which are on the door, which you can read. And if you don't read the terms and conditions, you won't know. But obviously, everything outside the premises says sex, girls, da, 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 da. come on in, have some drinks, da, da, da. but it's not the type that you want, really, if you're a young man. So uh, September 2007. Uh, so this is three years after the murder of Camille Gordon and after the Blue Bunny Club had been shut down. Um the London Local Authorities Act reclassified clip joints as sex establishments, meaning that they were required to uh, to have the relevant licences, which means everything changed from that point. So even though they weren't um, putting on sex shows or anything like that, they had to have a sex licence, they had to have an entertainment licence. Uh, and, you know, if they choose to sell alcohol, which they probably would, they'd have to have uh, an alcohol licence as well. So... Um, so that made a lot of changes. Obviously, clip joints thrived on the fact that they were extorting money, technically extorting money, technically, technically but not te technically. Um, and uh, th they were, you know, they were selling soft drinks at like two hundred pounds. All of that that basically disappeared. They just they couldn't rip people off anymore. Um, so finally, the council pulled the finger out, finger out, and done that. So a lot of clip joints either turned into legitimate lap dancing clubs and strip joints, or they just shut down. So um, a lot of the clip joints have kind of disappeared now, uh, which is interesting. Uh, what did I say? Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Uh, so Camille Gordon. Police wanted to speak to uh, a man who was seen talking to uh, Camille in, Peck in Peckham nightclub the, the night before. That was in Castaways. Uh, and a man who came to Kennington Police Station uh, to help police with their inquiries. Uh, and police there is still a twenty thousand pound reward for any information leading to her death uh, i'll put a picture on the website and the social media and the descriptions as well uh, and i think that is yeah we won't go into that that's all stuff isn't it good i think that's everything i think that's everything for the camille gordon case so um i hope that was interesting uh interesting case don't really know much obviously if if uh, if we hear any more details about the murder of camille gordon i'll uh i'll keep you in touch
almost cake time. Uh, uh, oh, so interesting news. Interesting news. Um, people have been asking for a while for merch. Merch. Besmerch. Besmerch and dies. Um, so, almost ready. By the time you hear this episode, which goes out next week, as I'm recording this, uh, the Murder Mile eShop will almost be ready. So uh, it'll be on the Murder Mile website, murdermiletours.com. I'll post a link on the on the Extra Mile episodes, and you can all have a look. And what I'll be doing is selling some interesting things. So I'll be uh, keeping it nice and simple. Uh, there will be a link if you want to buy T-shirts and hats and bags and stuff like that, but that's stuff that I'm not going to have anything to do with because it's too complicated. Too complicated. I decided that, you know, if if someone... Uh, if someone says to me, uh, can I have a large T-shirt? And I go, have you shaped the size? And they go, yeah, I have. Can I have a large T-shirt? And I send them a large T-shirt and they try it on. And then they go, oh, it's too small. Can I have a bigger one? It's like, oh, because my margins of profit are so slight. I'm just going to lose money and it's going to take me time just sorting out T-shirts. Just, oh, I just don't want to have the hassle of it. So there'll be a link. For, to, if you want to buy T-shirts and bags, you can do that. I have nothing to do with it. I, I literally get paid like a a little percentage of it but the great thing is i don't have to touch it i just get an email that says this person's ordered a t-shirt and that's fantastic uh so you can do that if you want to um i'll be doing murder mile mugs uh which i've got here uh, i don't have a lot of space on the boat for uh, uh goodies but there'll be a murder mile mug uh, with a couple of people i think uh, uh tracy and marie and uh i'll show them I can't remember who who do I send it to in America? Oh, who was in Missouri? Oh, I've forgotten your name. I'm so sorry. My brain has gone today. Uh, but you've all got Murder Mile mugs, and what I do is I make them into a kind of a, a, a Murder Mile kind of uh, listening experience. So you get a Murder Mile mug, and you get uh, some proper English tea bags, and some biscuits, and some sweets, uh, and a nice little thank you card for me. So you can sit there and you can listen to Murder Mile whilst drinking it. Same tea that I'm drinking, and having some of the biscuits I'm biscuit biscuiting. That's not even words so that I'm, I'm having as well. So um, you got those. I'm also doing ebooks for all of the uh, earlier Murder Mile episodes. So they they come in uh, blocks of ten. So the first ten episodes, all the original scripts, all unedited scripts. So you'll get to see all of the scenes that I probably took out uh because i i i especially these later episodes i heavily edit these episodes really heavily uh but it's all the original scripts with all my little notes in there as well so it's the first so um each ebook is uh probably about i think it's about fifty thousand words so it's about 70 to 80 pages each 10 episodes a piece uh and they're ebooks so you can just download them uh there'll be the murder mile ringtone that you can download you can also do have um you can request a personal message from myself <gasps> so whether it's someone's birthday or anniversary or you just want it for yourself wh- whatever um i can i'll do you a personal message that's on there yes i'm willing to whore myself out uh money is tight so i'm willing to do anything at the moment not anything but almost anything um I'm going to do uh, cards as well. So uh, a nice little card with some badges and stickers in. So if you want one of those, um, obviously the, there's a little markup on all of these prices uh, just because uh, this, I, I'm kind of using the eShop to help fund the Murder Mile website, uh, Murder Mile website, Murder Mile podcast, keep it all going. Uh, so yeah, you can get a handwritten card, a thank you from me with badges and things like that in there. Um, what else have I put in there? I, I will be eventually putting up my uh, my book that I wrote, uh, Nothing Is Impossible. So if you like my nonsense that I put into each episode, the kind of the sarcasm, uh, imagine the sarcasm times 10 for 300 pages yeah it's a good book i, I really enjoy it it's, it's I, I just unleashed unleashed all my venom in that book and uh I, I have a lot of fun with that so that so that will eventually be making that uh i also have a, a, a very talented person who is a uh, uh my stepmom who is a, a silversmith uh, and we are planning to do some special things for the e-shop, which I think will be very exciting. And uh, I'm going to make some connections with other people as well who uh, 
um, do interesting products that we can probably sell through the through um, through through Murder Mart eShop. So that could be quite exciting as well. So it's so it's uh, we're entering a new exciting world of tours and podcasting and eShop. This is pretty weird considering I I started this as a uh, if you've listen to the original extra mile episodes the, i i didn't plan this at all this was literally murder mile was an exercise to get me out of a kind of a depressive funk that i was in and it's yeah how many years on now it's like almost four yeah it's four years on and i'm still doing it and i'm still loving it and it's growing it's expanding into a do you know it's gone from being a writing exercise to to help me focus to being something to help me exercise physically to get me off my ass to then it became a kind of something to help my confidence because when I started doing the tours I was really nervous and it, I used to stand around the corner and go <gasps> like taking deep breaths because I was because I, I do you know I got to such a point where I was not very good at meeting people anymore I was afraid to you know, Whereas now I re- really love it. And now I do the tours. You know, I only do one a week because I don't want to ruin it for myself. I don't want it. I don't want it to become. I think if I do too many a week, it'll become dull. Hence, I don't. Some people email me and say, "Can I have a private tour?" And sometimes I say yes, but sometimes I do actually just say, uh, "No, uh, I'm busy that day because I just don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to be doing too many and making it boring for myself." Uh, and then, kind of, the podcast came along, which was kind of. I needed there were loads of stories I still had to tell I and it's great I'm loving it I love writing I really enjoy it so I'm powering through all that and now the e-shop uh, and I think I'll be do, I'll be trying to I try to obviously because you can't sell images that you don't own so I'm trying to design some images uh, for the e-shop as well some things maybe some Dennis Nielsen uh, kind of um mugs and badges i don't know i would i would love to do some blackout ripper stuff as well uh that will happen so the e-shop will progress over time and we'll put some interesting things in there so uh yeah hope that was interesting um people have been asking me questions about living on a boat uh so this is not true crime related it could be it could be but it probably isn't um so i thought i'd i'd give you a kind of a rundown of good and bad things of living on a little boat as I just mentioned, one of the one of the good and bad things, I guess, coming into winter now, uh, it's not too it's September, so it's not too cold at the moment. Uh, December it will start getting cold. January will be bloody freezing, um, because uh, the outside shell of the boat boat is steel, and we're sitting in water, so it's like the worst things for temperature. Like on a hot day, the steel of the boat literally you touch it and you burn your fingers, but on a cold day, it's like really cold. Like, even now in the mornings when I come out and look at the boat, it's covered in dew. It's literally, you can see it mottled everywhere. Uh, That's because the steel gets, it it reacts badly to temperature. Um, So, uh, the boat gets very cold. Uh, In winter, you can kind of, I can, I start putting my fire on, which is nice. It's lovely. That's why I don't have a telly. I'd kind of just sit there either podcast in or sometimes I just sit there staring at the fire because it's, it's mesmer- mesmeric when you're staring at the fire and it's fantastic um um but so in because I don't have a fridge too expensive I do have a fridge but I just can't be asked to plug it in because it burns through like 13 kilos of uh, propane uh, every two weeks so I just I don't use it but in winter what you can do is you, if you got things that need freezing not freezing or refrigerating you just put them on a lower level because everything below my knees in the boat boat is below water level so in winter it gets really cold so it's quite nice like um like if i buy some beers in the winter and i and they're not cold because i went to a crappy news agent i can pop them on the roof or if i've got cheese i can put it in the lowest shelf in my cupboard and it will still be good the next day which is really nice uh but if you don't time the fire correctly, if we don't learn to, I'm going to, have to, going to have to relearn to do fires again. If if you don't time it correctly, if you don't get it, if you get it, if you get it so it goes out at 3 a.m. By the time you wake up, it's freezing. You can see your breath. You're shivering. You go down. To, you reach down next to your bed to pick up your glass of water, and the glass of water is cold. It's like icy cold. Um, so you've got to time your fire just right uh one one weird thing that does happen quite a lot it's happening at the moment is 
because the sides of the canal tend to they tend to fill up with uh, silt or kind of quite often especially in town builders rubbish a lot of builders used to come in and just dump all their crap in the in the canal so even though my boat is kind of two and a half foot of it is underwater the sides of the canal uh, might only be three foot or or even less uh, which is all right. Sometimes you can moor yourself up and you're safe. But if someone leaves, leaves the paddles on, on the, the locks open, the water level on the canal can really drop drastically. And the amount of times I have woken up, like someone's left the paddles open, you wake up and your boat is listing like 15 degrees one way. Like I've, fall, I've woken up in the morning and fallen out of bed just because my boat is, is angled at like half past one on a clock. So uh, that can be really annoying sometimes. Someone did it uh, last year. Uh, and uh, yeah, we were trying to refill the, the, the canal, which is huge and it takes ages to refill it. So we all decided to go and try and go back to bed. But try going to bed when your entire world is like 15 to 20 degrees one way. It's like you just can't sleep. It's impossible. Uh, so uh, nice things about li li living on a boat. I don't have a telly. I keep life very simple. I have a, a, a small amount of books. I tend to rotate them. Uh, I take them back to the charity shops and then I pick up a new one every so often. Uh, what else? Uh, moving around, you, uh, di di like I'm in a nice place at the moment. Uh, haven't got any neighbours, which is good. Nice and peaceful, so that gives me a chance to make murder miles. Uh, but I'm also near enough to town, so I can get into town when I need to, and there's supermarkets near here and everything's very nice. Um, one of the bad things about living on uh, a boat is it can be a little bit confusing, especially at the start. So on my first ever night on the boat, about four years, God, no, it'd be close to five years ago now. Um, I picked up the boat. I'd done enough research on boats, but I, I wasn't, still wasn't too sure uh, ab about it. I picked it up in a marina. I checked out the boat. It was all very lovely, but. I needed an engineer to come by to check the engine, uh, to check the to, to service it, uh, and and it also needed a safety certificate and all the important things. So I was on the boat for about three days, and I was like, okay, well I can't switch the engine on. Uh, batteries are dead, hadn't got any gas. So I was like, okay, well it's it was the middle of winter. I was absolutely freezing. I thought, Do you know what, sod it. I'll put the fire on. So I, I put the fire on. It had been a long day. I'd been travelling all day. I'd just moved my stuff in. I was exhausted. I had a couple of cheeky beers, as you do. Um, and I was sitting there. I put the fire on. And it was blazing away. I put in one of those crappy, you know, those crappy logs that you light and you walk away. You don't have to do anything. And I was lying on the sofa and I was going, God, I'm really exhausted. Really massively exhausted. Like I was really, oh, I was thinking, God, I'm getting so it's been such a long day i'm getting such a headache as well and i started to nod off and i was feeling really tired uh and because i'm slightly paranoid i i hadn't really unpacked everything but the one thing i had unpacked was a carbon monoxide alarm the first things i, I did was a fire alarm a carbon monoxide alarm because i'd read that it, you know if you have a uh an, a fire that you know uh, carbon monoxide the smoke can be really deadly and it, as they say it is the silent killer so d you know make sure you've got fire alarms and carbon monoxide alarm they are they are even carbon monoxide alarms are even more important than fire alarms because carbon monoxide as they say is the silent killer you would not know it's creeping up on you and i didn't i'd got the fire on i was nice and toasty i was tired i was nodding off and the, fire, the, the carbon monoxide alarm was going off. It was wailing and wailing. I was going, why does it keep going off? And I kept switching it off and it kept going off. And the the, the little light on it, the red one was flashing and it was going. Meh, 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 meh. And I was like, what the frick is going on? And then I realized that my eyes were starting to really hurt. The, you know, they really kind of sore. And I opened up the um, uh, my side hatch and got, got out the window and then I realised that my head was really hurting. It was like, oh my god, I was slowly dying of carbon monoxide poisoning. And it wasn't there wasn't any effects that led me to it. I was starting to feel sleepy. I was sleepy and nodding off, and I was about to go into a nice long, very long sleep. Uh, so that can be one of the bad things about living on a boat: is dying of carbon monoxide poisoning. <laughs> Of course, I've fallen in a couple of times as well. Everyone has to. It's called. We all call it uh, the baptism. We all have to do it. Um, 
I fall, I fell in uh, uh, in my first whew, first month, I think. I made a rookie mistake. It was a really stupid mistake. I was chugging the boat through a lock, and on my left hand side was a weir. So a weir is basically an overspill of water from from one basically one river to another, and it's cu- and it was coming in and pushing boats from the left to the right. And as it was going downhill, it's pushed me left to the right, and it, and straight ahead was an extreme left turn. So I'm being pushed to the right, but then I've got to make a left. And the engine just wasn't gunning it enough. And some pillock had parked their boat right in the corner, which they're not meant to do. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm going to run into their boat. Now, if it was me now, I'd just think, sod it, I don't care. It's their boat. They're parked in the wrong place. I'm just going to ram it. Uh, Even if it's a plastic piece of crap, just ram it. Uh, (laughs) But... uh, I was new I didn't really understand that I didn't you know I was at that phase you know when you got something new you don't want it scratched and the boat was going near the uh the towpath on the right hand side so I thought oh shit uh my boat's gonna bang into the towpath so I got out of the boat whilst the boat was still moving I got out of the boat to push the boat out from the towpath and then I fell into the water and uh so I fell into the water right next to my boat, which is 15 tons. And I thought, oh, shit, um, I'm struggling. I'm struggling in the water. And someone had said to me, idiot. I mean, I, I understand why. They, they said, make sure you wear big boots, big, heavy boots, because you're dealing with steel and you don't want your toes to get crushed, which is a great idea. Except when you fall in the water and your feet start filling with uh water your boots start filling with water and they start getting heavy and then you grab hold of the towpath like i did and i was scrambling up there trying to try to get out of the water but there was gravel on the towpath i couldn't get my grip and my boots were filling with water and getting heavier and behind me my boat was coming near me all 15 tons of it which i i've seen it before someone tried to stop a boat which was going at a mile an hour with their foot and it broke their leg so I was not happy about it coming towards my back and my ribs. Uh, and I was trying to c- c- crawl out of the water. And a guy went past with his dog. And I was thinking he might help me. And he went, right. Like that, that's all he said. Oi! Like that. He gave me a hello. Even though I was quite clearly drowning. Bastard. I did, I did go searching for him afterwards. But he buggered off. Uh, that was fun. Another time, of course, I fell in. I was drunk. But yeah, it happens. So <laughs> that was a bit. That was a bit of a diversion. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. That was some. That was some major league waffle for me, wasn't it? You can tell. You can tell that I sit here by myself a lot, <laughs> having little conversations with myself. Uh, anyway, hope you enjoyed that. That was episode forty-five for Murder Mile. We'll be back next week for uh, uh, Extra Mile One, Two, and Three. Then we'll take a one-week break. And then we'll be back for the multi seat, the multi parters. Oh, that's exciting! So, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, no song this week, I think. I think, I think we'll survive without a song this week because uh, I can't think of one. Have fun, stay safe, don't fall into the water, don't wear heavy boots, um, don't come anywhere near me when I'm about to eat a nice oh, croissant. Look at that, that is gonna go down a tree. Hang on. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, that is very nice. Very nice indeed. So, I can't sing now because I've got a croissant in my mouth. So, um, have a good week. Lots of love. Bye-bye.